The title is Crash and Bean Applications, but maybe a different and better one could be, well, I broke my systems a couple of times and I don't want you to do it too. So <laughs> with that said, let's start with some context. So the first thing is why? So why, and I'm, I'm talking about breaking Bean apps. And I like to think of this talk as maybe a balance because we have a lot of Elixir is great, Bean is great, and talks like that. And it is great, don't get me wrong, I love Elixir. But I think it's important to also have those talks where uh, we show that not everything is perfect, there's no magic here. Uh, and maybe also don't make the same mistakes kind of talk. So I, I think that, that was my goal when doing that. Right, so after the why, the who. So uh, I'm Guy, uh, like Martin said, I'm speaking from Brazil, I live in Sao Paulo. I've been using Elixir since 2015. I started using it in a local startup here and I've been in love since I started using it. Before that, I did mostly Java, uh, C, Visual of PHP and some other stuff and since 2017 or 18, I think I've been a co-organizer of the Elixir uh, user group here in Sao Paulo. And right before COVID, we had our largest meetup ever with more than 80 people. So that was impressive. I was eager to pass the 100 person mark. But, well. And since 2017, I've been working at Telnix. Uh, the background here is actually a representation of all the data centers that Telnix has. Uh, Telnix is a communications platform as a service. So think like AWS, but for communication. And, uh, and the, the product I work there is call control. It's, about controlling phone calls via API and that entire product is built on top of Elixir. Uh, I joined at this first engineer and we have multiple services, all Elixir. The, most of the telephony services at Tonics are written in Elixir, so it's quite cool. And if you need some uh, a way to start a conversation with me, like a cool story, I love Bunny. So on the left here, you have Beast, he's really cute really old as well. And on the right, you have coffee and cookie. And they were on a train going to Elixir Conf EU, uh, I think one or two years ago when I really missed that. All right, so let's go to it. So for some things we often hear about the Bean. So when you're learning it or trying to sell it or just explain, some stuff that we usually talk about is how you have the actor model and how you have isolated processes and that you have garbage collector per process and that is amazing because it turns fast and doesn't have like stop the work stuff and all that and that it's super scalable and that you just let it crash which is amazing you know? Well, that's not the full picture. Like all of that stuff, it is true. Like we do have isolated processes. It is scalable uh, both vertically and horizontally. Uh, you do have let it crash, but I think perhaps the let it crash part is the one that is most misunderstood. And I think personally, I view the let it crash not as letting it crash, but it's more about providing a framework and semantics so you can reason about crashes. And well, the, the thing is the, the letter crash the supervisors, it works. Like sometimes you, you have failures and the supervisor restarts and you don't see it. But as I'm going to show, sometimes that's not the case. So how to crash your Bing applications. And the idea here is that I'm going to go through some examples that may or may not have happened 
to me in the past and explain like what were the assumptions like why uh, and why it happened so i i think i had about six of those it, it's interesting because i gave this uh talk in the past but there's always some new stuff that happens and i can add back to it so it well it happens all right so the first one is the case of exploding atoms and that one may seem trivial for a lot of people that have been using Beam for a while, but I see stuff like this happen uh, often. Uh, if you go to Elixir forum now and then, there's always a question about how to deal with atoms. And it's things like the stream to atom, and the stream here is already telling you what don't do it. And so, I think what happens maybe that uh, because of people background coming from other languages, they may feel like uh, you should use atoms in Elixir, maybe because that's what we use for uh, extract keys and other stuff. But the thing is, atoms are limited. They are uh, some piece of data that is allocated and is not collected ever. And there is a limit to it. So, this is a simple call that can uh, crash the beam. Of course, I don't think anyone's going to write exactly that. It's just generating a bunch of random strings and then converting those to atoms. And if you run that, at some point, you're going to get a crash because you're going to exhaust the limit of atoms that you can have in the beam. Um, this here, the maximum is not the real one. I think the default is more than a million. So it is quite large. It's not something that is going to happen easily. But if you start you know, generating atoms from external data, from when parsing JSON and stuff like that, it can happen. So just as a reminder, things that are atoms are module names, node names, struct fields. And if you do decode this atom, that you really Shoot and do. And speak the first one, the module names, like when uh, I first started using Elixir, um, me and my colleagues, we tried to you know Haskellize an enum library for Elixir that each value was a module. So we, we ended up creating a bunch of modules. And that is the sort of thing that you, you start doing and then generate a bunch of stuff. So. And the Haskellized thing is also I don't recommend, like Haskell is one thing, but there's another don't use. All right, so first example, just atoms, the thing, they are limited, you should pay attention. Then the second one is the case of link, link agent. And this is fun because it's basically misunderstanding stuff. So the idea was, there was a process and wanted to uh, spawn a task for an agent that was linked to it so that when the initial process died, the other task will, would die too. So a linked process linked to the first one, right? So uh, you use start link, start a new thing. And then if the first process died, the other one died too. So that was okay. But then if it exit normally, it just stayed there, like I'm a survivor. And the, the thing is, that is the expected behavior. Like once you go back and read competition, it is actually that. I also have a simple code to that shows this. Right? This is a function that spawns uh, um, a function in that the, the start link is starting in an agent and then exiting normally. So to run that, I initially had like 50 process. I ran this call for 10, so that creates 20, 20 new process. I wait for the initial one to die and then there's still 10 left. So that was a misunderstanding of my part. 
And what it can cause is if you start a process and that just lingers on forever, it's memory that is just there increasing and also a process that is, is there. So you also have quite a large, but you do have a limit on the amount of process that you can have with being. So a bit dumb, like, but read documentation. So the way to do that, like the initial goal was to have a process that if the initial one dies and it doesn't matter if it's an exception or normally, the other one goes too. And the way to do that is to have a process monitor. So you can monitor the uh, process ID and you receive a message when uh, the uh, another process uh, dies. And this is about well, the being guarantees that you're going to receive that message. So the initial process dies, you get a message saying that it's down, and then the other one can exit to you. Right, so third example, the case of request monitoring. This one is uh, a bit more interesting than the other one, it's, it's not just a, a small mistake. So. But it has something like this. Uh, there was incoming request, uh, Phoenix API, and we had to do several uh, stuff uh, when processing that, like reading some uh, data from the database, for doing internal API call, update database, publish to a queue, and all that. And we wanted to track what was happening, kind of like, uh, adding breadcrumbs, like red uh, data from DB, all that. So if there was an error, we could you know, see the, the, everything that was done during that. And the way we uh, done that is that the tracker created an agent for, for every process and we could add those metadata. So if the initial process for uh, handling the request died, we will get the breadcrumbs from the tracker and then send an exception report with that. So for each request, we would start a new agent, monitor the agent and the process, like I just had shown before, and then queue the agent if the process ends normally, or in case of exception, just grab the breadcrumbs, report the exception, and then kill it, right? And then uh, well, we implemented that, we tested it, it was working okay, we put it in production, and the process count is started rising, like, real quick. It's like, okay, why? It, is the monitor not working? Like, that That was the, the lesson you had just learned, like, you should monitor the process, you get a message, is it not getting the message? What were you doing wrong here? And the issue actually was keep alive. So Cowboy implements the keep alive thing by reusing the process. So what was happening is that the process handling the request was the same. So we get a new request, we spawn an agent, but that process never, it, it, it didn't die, it was reused. So another request came, the same process was reused. So we spawn another agent and it just kept going on and on and on. Right, so we got agents forever. Well, the solution here was to you know just clean up the the agent, grabbing the breadcrumbs uh, at the end of the request, so then it didn't have to spawn new one every time. But also, process limit. So if we let it go on and on, we would reach it because it, it wasn't it wasn't going to. Uh, be killed or end. Right. Then we have the case of the infinite restarts. That one is fun. So, well, we had a process uh, and we are using an exception monitor library. So th that process dies. The, there is an error reporter task that is created that is in a task supervisor. And so process dies, 
the library picked up the error from logger, created a new uh, reporting task in the supervisor, send the report and all that. But then at one time, we couldn't reach the remote API for the exception tracking service. So that means the error reporting task failed, which is fine, like couldn't do its job. But the task supervisor in the virtual library had a start child with restart transient. Restart transient means that it, it will be restarted until it ends normally. So what happened is that we will get a new reporting task. The remote API would be down, that would crash, and it would restart again. And the crashing would also generate an error. So we had exploding things. So you got an error report, it crashes, it generates another error. So then you respond with two, and then those two fail. And then, well, for that one, we actually crashed the application, we reached the process limit. And the, the fix was one thing, like move to restart temporary. And so one line change that can could make a big difference. And the interesting thing is that restart temporary is the default. So if you don't pass any options when you starting a child under a supervisor, it would work. So it was something that was actually had some talk into it, like let's do restart transient. I, I think maybe the, the goal would be like, I always want to report if there's any issue, I'll try again, but then it's, well, stay like that. Then the case of the waiting process. And this one is fun because it happened this, well, last month. So I had something like that. I had a request, came through process, and then we use a task supervisor, start a child for a notifier. It would just get the payload uh, and notify some other stuff. So for every request, we did the same thing, right? And this notifier is supposed to be a short-lived process. It just gets the payload, does one HTTP request, and then it's gone. And once you put that in production, uh, not, not, actually not in production, uh, in the test servers, and we run a load test, and we saw the memory usually start increasing and also the process count. So you can see here that we had uh, more than 100K processes. And after, after the load task was stopped, they stayed constant. So they, they weren't going down, but those are supposed to be uh, short-lived processes. They just do one HTTP request if it fails, uh, it's not restarted. So I don't understand why weren't in, then going down. And we had a look and we saw this. Uh, there was the ENAT get host native and it had more than 100,000 messages in this message queue. So what was happening is that we didn't configure anything regarding ENAT get host's DNS resolution. So we, we didn't configure anything with uh, regarding DNS res resolution in, and the default is to use the uh, native resolution, which is this one. And for native resolution, it means that it goes to uh, the system, it uses a port, and for it, it it uses uh, a pool. The default pool is just four. So at this load test, we were uh, testing with uh, 100 requests per sec, not 100, 1,000 requests per second. And because it, it is uh, 
uh, native in Google support, it's kind of like a, a, a bottleneck. You, you have to go to one single process uh, to get the DNS resolution and then back. Uh, and that wasn't explicit to us. That happens um, internally. We're using Hackney for its B client. So goes there, Hackney go, calls to do DNS resolution, it gets back. So with that load, what was happening is that we got to a point that all of those processes were waiting in the queue. The thing I didn't get to the point of figuring out is why didn't it time out the DNS resolution? Those processes were just waiting. So it's kind of like uh, it, there was a huge timeout for, for that call or something else, but it's the same issue. So we are getting a thousand requests, uh, a thousand requests per second, creating a process that should be short lived and die, but then they were all waiting. So they then we link home. So if that load continue for a while, we would have hit the limit because in just two minutes, we got a hundred uh, thousand process that would stay on. Then we have the case of the message router. That one, <clears throat> uh, I, I think it was one of the issues that made me learn a lot, uh, made me learn the most maybe. So the concept was this, there were uh, some fleet of uh, trucks and all of them had a tracking device. And that tracking device uh, used a TCP socket to talk to a backend server. That backend server also provided an API so that uh, you could issue commands for that, for any specific tracking device and all that was stored in the database. Well, internally, what we had was a message router. So we had those TCP sockets, we got a message and the message router was responsible for you know, routing the message to the proper uh, gen server. So it had one server for each of these devices. So we could you know, route commands and also uh, those uh, messages. All right, and there wasn't a lot of uh, uh, concurrent devices. We we're doing a task with like, I think 2000 devices, which is not a lot. And quickly after 2000 concurrent devices sending uh, events, there was an out of memory error and that crashed the beam. And that was also very confusing to me because I said, well, why is it crashing? Because I'm getting the message, it goes to the message router, it goes in the server, it process that and saves to the database. And then the, I don't do anything else with that particular message. So I had to go and learn about how Bing handles memory. Because remember back with stuff that was saving, say we have isolated processes that we have a garbage collector per process and all that. And in fact, that is not entirely true. So the, the Bing VM process is uh, composed of these. You have a control block, but you have metadata like the PID, the process name. Then you have the stack and uh, the heap where variables and the mailbox messages are stored, right? But then in the heap, you also have uh, something that's called uh, a prop in. Because besides the, the process memory, we also, we also has a shared heap. And the shared one is for what is considered large binaries. So everything that is small, it, it stays inside the process. So it is isolated, it's specific to the process. But Anything larger than 64 bytes is considered a large binary and it goes to the shared heap. And the shared heap is reference counted. So in the process heap, what we have is a reference to uh, the binary that lives in the shared one, right? So how does it work? For the private heap, uh, you have a garbage collection that is generational. So you have a young generator 
young generation for newly uh, allocated data, and you have the old one uh, that survives uh, the garbage collector for that particular process. And there's two types of uh, garbage collector runs. You have a, a full sweep and a generational run. So a generational one is cheaper and it happens for the process. And the, so the generation only cleans the new data. And the full sweep is the one that happens uh, in some cases that there's after some amount of runs of the generation one, or if the uh, process internal heap size grows too much. And then only in the full sweep one is that those uh, reference are going to be cleaned. So the shared heap garbage flasher is reference counted. So any binary dot reference will be clean. So what was happening here is that the problem with the message router was it was receiving messages that were larger than 64 bytes. So they were like large binaries and went to the shared heap and the message router kept uh, a reference to it. But the message router itself didn't use a lot of uh, uh, memory. It, it was just getting those messages, uh, calling a registry to know uh, which device to send and then forwarding the event. So the internal heap, the, the stuff that was actually there wasn't growing. So that meant the, the garbage collector that cleaned those reference that were not being used uh, wasn't happening that, that often. So the solution for that, uh, we, uh, there were some we could do like add a, a flag to the process saying full sweep after, and you say, well, do a full full sweep uh, garbage collector more often, maybe after five generational runs or something like that. There's also another thing: if uh, there's a process that doesn't get a lot of uh, messages, you could hibernate it. So after it processes a message, a message it hibernates and that runs a garbage collector. And then when you get a new message, it's going to be re uh, kind of like restarted, something like that. Or <laughs> move to a short lived process because this only happened because the message router was a long lived process. It stayed up for as long as the app was running to route everything. And because of that, the reference word was still there. Another thing that I think is interesting talking talk about that, uh, some uh, JSON parsing libraries like JSON, you can do a parse as copy because the way it works, you get a, the JSON blob and when you parse it and create a map, as sometimes what's going to happen is that you have sub binaries. So some particular uh, value is actually uh, a part of a string of the large JSON. So even if you're not going to do anything with the initial uh, JSON string, but the parse uh, thing is going to live forever. You might be keeping a reference to the whole thing be just because of a small part, so also interesting. And those are all the examples that I had. Uh, the, I think the interesting about all of them is that it wasn't something that was clear uh, to me. The When Bing crashed, it was kind of a surprise and I had to learn more. And it wasn't the let it crash thing didn't really work. Like there wasn't no supervisor or thing to save me in those cases. So moving on, what I'm going to talk is what to do when that, sort, that stuff happens. And actually what to do before it happens, right? So one thing, about the Bing is that it is very operable. It provides you the tools to go and do that. But there are some stuff that you should uh, have before you move to before you move to production. So you have to have a way of connecting to the node. So if you do IX, you you get a session and there's no. But if you when you start a node, you give it a name and you give it a cookie, and then you start another session with the same cookie, you can connect to it. So 
this looks a bit uh, cumbersome. So we are, oops, we're starting something, giving it a name in a cookie, and then you have to know that cookie and connect to the other thing, and then you, you can connect. So, but if you're using mixed releases, then there's salt for you. So if you do a mixed release and you do, uh, you know, my app start, then you also get my app remote, which does exactly that. When you generate the release, it's going to, you know, generate the cookie and all of that for you. And at, at that, Atomix, for example, we run everything inside Docker. So you can also do, you know, Docker uh, exact and run the my app remote inside the container and it just works. So once you do that, this is uh, something that you need to do beforehand because if you look at the graph and the process count is rising and things like that, if you have it operated, you can actually go and operate it and actually see what's happening. So there are some native things uh, that you're always going to have that are helpful for you. So you have a way of listing all the process. Uh, you, there's a way to get the process information. So you get the process state. Uh, the sys gets underlined uh, stuff. There are some functions that are helpful. So you can inspect uh, a process state and use that to figure out what's happening. Besides that, there are also some tools that I recommend that you have like the observer CLI. And that is just like the observer tool, you start that in the terminal when you're connected, you see um, the, the processes, uh, uh, there are message queues, the current function, you have VM stats like memory, uh, the amount of binary atoms, uh, you have network ports, you have apps, all that stuff. I highly recommend it, like just add it to all of your apps. Then there's also Phoenix Live Dashboard. If you're using a Phoenix app, uh, now you have Phoenix Live Dashboard. It's kind of like almost the same thing. You, you have like a different view of the observer CLI, but in your browser. So you also have the processes, the ports, the sockets, but well, observer CLI works for stuff that is not Phoenix. Another one is Recon. Recon is a library created by uh, Fred Herbert. And it the goal of it is to have a lot of useful functions for those sort of cases when you need to figure out what's happening. So that one I add to all of my projects as well. I really recommend it. One highlight of it is the Bing leak function. Uh, this is the one I use for uh, looking at the message router thing. When you run it, it's going to get the state of the processes, uh, force uh, a garbage collector, and then see which process had the largest amount of memory released. Because if they have a lot of that, it's probably the culprit of you know, keeping a lot of uh, reference count in that that should be cleaned up. So that is amazing. The other thing, metrics and visibility. So for the VM metrics, we have uh, VM stats, then also Fred Hubbard puts to stats D. We have the Prometheus library that sends you no know, metrics to Prometheus. We have telemetry that I'm not going to talk about because we have talks about that. But the thing is with those sort of stuff, with telemetry, with uh, Prometheus, you should you can create your own dashboards and you can see how your app is performing and look at those specific metrics. So the process count, memory, ports, uh, like hackney connection pools, all that stuff. Uh, create dashboard for Raptor queue, for example. The other thing, log aggregation. Like, you should have a way of aggregating logs and see what's happening. And error reporting. Uh, this is a screenshot of Bugsnag. Uh, quick thing, I'm now maintaining the Bugsnag library for Elixir. So if you have any issues with that, just tell me. And find the bottom line. I think we're almost in the time. The bottom line is that 
the bean is amazing. It gives us uh, really great semantics for uh, handling faults. It is very operable. It gives you a lot of introspection metrics and tools. So I really think it is amazing. But there, there are still a lot of ways that you can break your systems, be it by mi um, misunderstanding of your part of how something works or some properties of your system. So I think you need to understand uh, that semantics and that framework so you can design for it. It, it. It's not just let it crash. Sometimes it just, it does crash. And don't go to production without visibility. You, you, you need to uh, be able to see what's happening and be able to operate. And in that sense, I strongly urge you to read Erlang in Anger. Uh, that book is amazing. It, it just it talks about that, like stuff that happens in production, what goes bad, and what you should do to figure it out. By Fred Herbert, uh, the same engineer that wrote Recon, that is incredible. And that was it. So, obrigado. Thank you, everyone.